Hey everyone, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm a uh, board member at the Alma Linux Foundation and our community manager. I uh, just want to thank Jerry for uh, inviting me here to uh, speak. Yeah, I was actually going to start off by saying happy birthday to Debian because it's their 30th birthday, which is a very, very amazing milestone for them to have reached. So uh, happy birthday, Debian. <laughs> um, I have a slide deck, but I don't even think I want to put it up. Uh, I think that I'll just run through like a little bit about um, about the project, about who we are, what we are, what we do, how we do it, and then we can just turn it over to some Q&A, which I think might be more interesting to everyone. So um, uh, Alma Linux basically started uh, when Red Hat made the announcement that they were um, basically ending life of CentOS Linux as we know it and moving to CentOS Stream. Uh, there was a lot of, I'll say, tumult at the time. And, uh, you know, me, along with a few of the other people on the project, uh, basically looked around and, you know, we, we had good experience doing this already for a very long time. So we decided uh to go ahead and you know and and just do it um we said why not um the one thing that like really helped guide us as a project was you know the big the big problem with uh centos was that it it was always owned by someone right it was it was in the beginning there was some ownership by uh lance who started the project and then kind of disappeared and then um, you know, it, it basically like transferred from him to other people and then from there to Red Hat. And so there really wasn't like if you if you look at the Debian model where there's really like a community nonprofit that guides and steers the distribution, there just that didn't exist in the enterprise Linux space. And so that's why we decided um, to start our project and start it as a, as a nonprofit. I think if, if anyone's paying attention to what's going on now with the recent announcement of uh, Open ELA, I think that really validates what we did because they decided to start uh, as a nonprofit as well. Um, and I think that's very, very important for the EL community at large. And it just really uh, helped validate uh, what we did early on. So um, we were really, really glad to see that. Um, in terms of like our distribution, so we were one to one compatible with RHEL until RHEL decided to uh, put the sources behind the subscriber agreement. Um, when that happened, uh, we basically decided to shift our project to be. You're dropping out, Jack. Oh. Is that any better? Cool. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so what I was saying that we, uh, when Red Hat uh, made the licensing shift, we also decided to shift. So basically right now we're going to be ABI compatible with RHEL and um, that lets us do a lot of very interesting things because um, some of the things we've we started doing already, like releasing security updates before Red Hat does. Um, if people paid attention, uh, there was actually a CVE um, in in iperf uh, like uh, a month back, and we basically were able to patch that and fix it, and then we actually contributed that uh, that fix to Red Hat. Um, and then we released it ourselves. All of the the stuff now with uh, the AMD um, speculative stuff that's uh, causing a lot of headaches for everyone. We also released updates for that. And we're actually asking people to go ahead and, and test those as well. And uh, we're actually going to start putting out like a whole testing repository um, with just stuff that, uh, you know, lets us get ahead of the curve and lets us introduce like certain features or different different kernels with different built differently with different configs or different functionality. 
Um, and that's really, uh, really, really exciting for us. Um, the base of our project was always centered around community engagement. Um, that's really what the roots of our project are in. It's just, you know, we, we saw there were like a lot of commercial interests getting involved um, when Red Hat made the change and we decided that we definitely wanted something that was really a lot more along the lines of the, the Debian SPI model um, and something where, you know, community members are active members and, um, and uh, can actually vote and have a say in, in how things are run. Yeah, I see John has a question. By the way, feel free to ask questions. You don't need to wait till I'm done or anything. Yeah, I just had to interrupt here for a second. I went to uh, monitor the uh, the stream on YouTube, but it still says waiting for Jerry Feldman. So either the link on the uh, blue page is wrong, or you're uh, or whatever you what you're doing is recording correctly. Can you check that, Jerry? You may have to hit go live, Jerry. Oh, is is that right, Jerry? You're recording to a file. And not to you too. You're muted, so I can't hear whatever it is you're saying. It would be nice if I unmute. I'm recording to a local file because you weren't listening. Oh, okay. Um, because we can't stream. It keeps uh, telling me the streamers are all down at the moment. So that's why you're seeing the waiting for me. I can try it now. I don't know if that's going to work along with the recording. So I'm going to leave it recording because it's going to save on my system. So the live stream is not working. Yeah, all streamers are currently busy. Okay, Jack, go ahead, continue. Yeah, I'll just continue, uh, I guess, Jerry, and then uh, you can post it up afterwards. That's fine. Uh, so like I was saying, um, you know, the, the, our whole model was around community engagement. Um, I think that one of the things that we pride ourselves on is just our, like, technical um, understanding um, and technical, really, it's it's tremendous amount of technical experience doing this stuff because we have people on our team that have been doing this ever since like RHEL was RHEL. So uh, that gives us tremendous amount of, of knowledge, um, not only in, in how to go about um, getting the code, processing the code and doing the builds, but you know, everything from like the tooling that's necessary um, to do this work and just like processes that need to be put in place. So uh, we have very, very good technical chops around doing this. And that that that's really, again, another one of the reasons that kind of drove us to, to jump into this. Um, like I said, we're a 501c6, so we're totally not profit. Uh, non profit can't be bought or sold. Um, it can only be transfer to another nonprofit. So um, we have a great membership structure for our project. So basically anyone in our community can sign up to become a, a, like a voting member and then voting members uh, vote in our elections. We already held one. We're about to hold another one uh, just in a couple of months. We're going to start ramping up uh, all the notification and stuff that needs to be done on that now so that we can uh, do that at the end of September, the beginning of October, depending on, you know, how the schedule lays out with that. In, in our bylaws, we have like set times for certain things. So it's not like we can just uh, do it arbitrarily. Um, uh, what can I say? I mean, we've been enjoying lots of success. Uh, we've gotten lots of adoption, um, you know, from our, like uh, uh, the, the, some of the stats that we hear back from some of the vendors and even like Fedora um, that track stuff like count me. I mean, we see like, you know, hundreds of thousands of systems installed with us right now. Um, it's actually funny after we made the shift a few weeks ago, the numbers went, went up 
when a lot of people were, uh, you know, less than less than convinced that people were going to stick with us. So um, it was great. It was great to see that pop. And uh, you know, we're we're available everywhere. We're available on you know four different architectures, Raspberry Pis in the cloud. Um, basically, wherever you wherever you want to run it, we're there. Um, and that's it. And our, our focus now moving forward is basically just to figure out, you know, how we can be as innovative as possible and, and what the, what our user base and community needs and what the EL community needs, which really wasn't ever there before, wasn't ever a possibility before, because people were just taking Red Hat's code and rebuilding it. And now that we kind of opened the, uh, the gate um, to walk beyond that, uh, I think it opens up a lot of possibilities for us. And like I said, we've already started doing them and we're going to continue doing them. And uh, that's going to be our direction from now on. And, um, you know, we're we're very certainly very optimistic about that. Um, we think that it'll bring a lot of good. Uh, to us um uh updates quicker security updates or, or you know package updates or whatever it is faster than upstream um i think it's like a nice middle ground between actually where fedora is and where rel is so uh that's definitely something that we're very very excited about and uh i guess you know i'm i'm just here to talk about it as much as you'd like me to and if anyone has any questions that certainly uh that's certainly you know something that uh is is very welcome and i guess i'll open it up to the floor and uh you know anyone can ask away Well, um, I'll ask if nobody else is yet. Um, so I know there were there were changes recently um, with, with with Red Hat and Alma. And as somebody who doesn't understand that that well, could you explain it in in sort of a a layman's term? Yeah, the changes that we're making are the changes that Red Hat made. So I, I and, and you'll have to forgive me. I know there was just something in the news about Red Hat making a change and Alma responding in a way, and it had to do with yeah. upstream where packages come from, things like that. And I, I, yeah. I literally just haven't been paying atten enough attention. And I, you know, hearing a good summary m might help, and, and hearing it from the sources actually would be really helpful. Right. So basically, the change is this: Red Hat used to publish their sources publicly. Right, and anyone could get them and rebuild them, and that's what us and several other projects uh, were doing. Um, the change is that now Red Hat decided uh, that they're actually not going to publish those publicly and only make them available to customers. So if you have a Red license and you want to download source, you'll be able to download source. Otherwise, they're not publicly available. Now, um, the terms of being a customer uh, explicitly prevent you from using it to build your own clone effectively, right? So they basically cut everyone off. Uh, anyone that was doing a rebuild, uh, they cut everybody off. Um, so that's the change that they made. Now, the change that we made in response to that is um, we, some of the other projects that were doing rebuilds decided that, well, they don't care and they're just going to get the source from wherever they can find it, whether it's legal or illegal, and, you know, they'll just make it available and, and call it a day and continue, like, humming right along. Um, the thing that we decided to do was um, we're only going to use sources that are publicly available. So most of the RHEL stuff actually is published in CentOS Stream. Um, it's a little bit, not a little bit, it's a lot harder because... Now, instead of just pulling like a package source and doing a rebuild, we have to look through different patches that were applied and different chain sets. And we have to figure out what Red Hat did to go from the stream source to the actual final like package that was built in RHEL. So it's not exactly like a one-for-one -one rebuild anymore. 
Um, but basically the promise that we're giving everyone is that uh, we're going to maintain ABI compatibility. So any application that you have or any stack that you have that runs on rel will run just as well on us for the same uh um you know the same version number so um it's a, a little bit of a change from the previous way that we were doing things but i think that it's actually something that will ultimately benefit the community um because it opens doors to a lot of possibilities now that you're not like essentially locked down into just like regurgitating red hat code right um and that that's what's exciting for us. Does that does that answer the question, Brandon? It it answers the question and, and opens up like seven more questions. And I don't want to hog your time, but um very, very quickly, two quick ones. One, do you guys publish some sort of a diff between what you guys put out and what Red Hat puts out uh when, when you do releases and, and two, what stops Red Hat? I, I and, and I get just guess I don't know this. I thought Red Hat had sent offs. What stops them from saying, okay, nobody can access the CentOS stream sources anymore, even though they for years allowed it, or, or maybe I have that wrong. Yeah, um, the truth is nothing at this point. Um, you know, just like uh, we we always thought that they would never take that step of putting the previous uh, uh, rel source behind you know some sort of like paywall or something like that right um the fact is that you know they, they, there still are lots of questions around uh is that compatible with the gpl um you know if you want my personal opinion i think that my personal opinion is it, it probably is but then again things like that th there's no like the, the license can say what the license says, but until it's actually litigated, there's no like case law and no precedent for doing something like that, you know? So um, uh, unless we want to wait around and, and, and see the GPL like dragged into court and try to see, you know, what of that is, is, is going to be upheld and what isn't going to be upheld, um, there's no like cut and dry answer on, on what they did. You know, I, I, I will, I will, venture to say that it based on like the strict letter of the gpl it probably is totally legal what they did right and now um what stops them from doing the same thing with stream i mean really technically nothing except for the fact that you know stream is supposed to be where like the the public code lives once it gets snapshotted from fedora right um so I, I don't really see, like, unless you're going to close up Fedora as well, I don't really see a benefit in closing upstream. But I mean, you know, if, 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 any, if the last few months have taught us anything, it's that, you know, we, we, should, we should plan on expecting the unexpected, even if it never happens. Yeah, it sounds like they're, you know, they may be following the letter of the law, but not necessarily the spirit, the spirit and of the trusting law. IBM to do you know what's been the best interest of the users has not always been the the best yeah. thing as a long time centos user in our enterprise and then finding out two years ago or however long it was that that was changing we had to go out and buy all red hat um and and, and, and you know, everything is just upended now yeah um look i i, I think that like i want to say there's nothing wrong with paying red hat for rel Right. I think that a lot of people are like very, very against that and very, you know, uh, in line with the thinking that, uh, you know, Red Hat uh, and, and really any other corporate entity or whatever, like should not charge for Linux. Right. Um, I actually happen to think that's OK um, in terms of what they're doing and the value that they're adding for their customers. I think that the their customers, quote unquote, is is a very um, specific term here, right? Because I think the the people like Red Hat doesn't necessarily view the community as their customers, right? The their customers are like really, really extremely large enterprise that are going to drop like millions of dollars on on support contracts with them, right? So for for anyone to come and say like 
the layman developer or whatever is Red Hat's customer, I really don't think that's true. Like if, if you're looking at that, you should be looking at Fedora and not looking at RHEL. Um, but, you know, given, given like things are the way they are right now, um, like I said, you know, there's no, you, you don't really want to trust anyone um, um, because trust seems to be a very devalued currency nowadays uh, going around in the community, which, which is really like, I think, a, a, like a meta story about what's happening here, but really no one's talking about it yet. Um, but it's just kind of disappointing to, to really see. Um, and, and, and I don't mean that only from Red Hat's end. I mean that like from all different facets and all different like different sides and different players and different, you know, groups in the community. So um, it's just, uh, it, it's it's really like a tragedy. And I, I think that also spurred, like if anyone saw um, the news that HashiCorp is moving to business source license, like I think things like this really put open source at risk too. And uh, we as a community need to do our best to, to make sure that we preserve that because uh, I would really terribly hate to see that going away. Uh, I myself have been involved in, in, in open source for over 25 years. Uh, and, you know, I, I just, I really, uh, uh, as, a, as a principle and as a philosophy, I really, really value that model. And I would hate to see that damaged um, because of, you know, some, some fun and games that people decided they wanted to play. Well said. What is this? Well, I guess I guess they must have put everyone else to sleep. Actually, can you talk about the uh, CPU issues if you're having them? Just for reference, um, when I uh, I was running Rocky Eight for a while, well, I, I still am. But at one point, I tried to upgrade to Rocky Nine, and the thing failed completely. And it looks like there's some incompatibility with the CPU. I guess it was like some new type of CPU driver. And, uh, for some oh, yeah. So they enabled. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Red Hat basically deprecated like uh, x86 V1 CPUs. Um, and, and, and that's purely because of the way that they build the kernel and what they wanted to support in the kernel. Um, and again, us now moving away from being strictly one to one compatible with Red Hat. Let's us do things like bring back in um, the older CPU support, right? I, I, I know specifically like lots of um, institutions that I spoke to, um, they needed support for older CPUs because they had older hardware laying around. And of course, you know, they decided to make an investment in that hardware and they didn't want to... Uh, uh, just abandon that investment because the operating system decided like, we're not going to run this anymore. Right. And, and they were running rel previously and they were running CentOS previously. And they actually, they decided to, to probably move to Debian because Debian still supports that stuff. Right. But now um, we have the opportunity to go ahead and, and, you know, build for, for that um, sub architecture, let's call it. Right. So that, um, we can now, will we do it? Will we not do it? I don't know. There's a lot of effort involved in doing that, but uh, yeah, just being able, being able to have that capability um, is really uh, uh, fantastic, like fantastic uh, outcome from all of this. Does Alma directly provide professional services for something, a scenario like that, or is that something you just leave to individual no, developers? In no, yeah, we, we, we don't have any commercial interests at all. So um, th there are other support providers that you can find, but, you know, all of our support is like basically people coming into our IRC, Mattermost, uh, on the forums, uh, Reddit, whatever it is, and, and just asking people for help. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad to say, like, from the start of the project till today, I don't think we've ever turned the person away where we couldn't help them with what issue they were facing.
I don't know if Kurt's trying to say something. He just he just picked up his mic. I don't know. I just uh, can comment. I can uh, I can relate to some of that stuff uh, when I was at uh, Digital, and Mad Dog can probably uh, back me up on that on the Alpha. You know, when they were changing the different versions of the alpha and different capabilities, you know, the question, can you maintain the back, full backwards compatibility to that? And one of the jobs that I had to do in the compiler group was to work on the uh, section of the compiler that actually, or I did the assembler. And the section that actually did with the uh, reordering of the code. And that actually very strictly depended on what version of the processor you're dealing with. Yeah. And uh, at one point when they started doing out of order execution on the uh, chip itself, that tended to eliminate the need for that. So that's so I can totally relate what Red Hat and as a former Red Hat employee to yeah. I wasn't in that group. Yeah, I think from their perspective, they just want to be able to, you know, like set a baseline for expectation of what they're going to be able to get out of the underlying hardware that the operating system is running on. And so that's why they made that decision. Now, again, you know, things like this, where this is like a, a, a basically like a customer driven kind of thing, right? I mean, like there must be Red Hat customers that came to them and told them, look, like, you know, we, we, we have a certain expectation and this is what we need to hit. And then Red Hat came back and made those changes, right? And so that, that doesn't really necessarily apply to the community at large, right? Um, and and I, I'm glad to see that there's ways to make that happen now um, that weren't present before. Yeah, it was a problem. Um, you know, we even dealt with it back years before, before I ever got into compilers or anything. We had to deal with it back in the uh, 80s. And that was, we're talking about uh, 16 to 32 bit issues. So I guess, I, I actually found out the other I day, I was actually older, older than Mad Dog. I'm curious. Um, what what are the differences uh, between the these newer CPUs and the ones they deprecated? Is that like going for just, support with the 120 uh, bit or something like that? No, I think it's just no, like uh, updated instruction uh, sets. It's more really like in the uh, internal um, the internal. Uh, design of the uh, of the chips and and the newer instruction sets that kind of give things like a little certain certain um, you know certain processes like a, a little bit of a boost. Yeah, maybe there was, they just hit a threshold of there's there's X yeah. percent of computers out there with this chipset at this point. Yeah. It's not worth maintaining yeah. that old code. Uh, for yeah. all of them. Plus, like you said, if it's a performance issue, a commercial company is not going to want their stuff to perform like crap just because some corporation is keeping 12-year-old servers around where it technically runs on it. Um, and if you just cut that off, then you can guarantee at least some base, base minimum of performance. But it, it's still sad for you know people that actually need that 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 small percentage. Yeah, and and I think like, look, you have to understand like they, you have to compile the whole distribution against that instruction set right so if you're <laughs> it's not like it's not like it's a small thing by any stretch right it's like if if i'm if i'm building for the lowest common denominator like of course i'm not going to be able to take care of the uh, take advantage of the latest and greatest stuff that's baked into all the new hardware right so i think you know they just decided that 
for whatever reason, this is this would benefit their customers, and that's what they decided to do. Yeah, I think that I would have made the same decision. You know, I've had to deal with that going back uh, many, many years. And I said going back to the 80s before Linux. Yeah, I mean, at, 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 some, point, at, at some point, every technology becomes every technology obsolete, becomes right? Obsolete. So yeah. whether that's forced or whether that's, uh, uh, you know, just happens by itself. But at some point, all good things must come to an end. Okay. It really leaves people like me up in the cold. I'm, I'm not doing this for business. I just get I get these a nice servers on eBay for like ninety nine dollars. So every, yeah. every time Fidelity's getting rid of them, yeah, and, um, <laughs> they're, they're, they tend to be pretty old. But let's take a look at another uh, operating system you may have heard of. It's called Windows XP. When Microsoft walked away from Windows XP and said they weren't going to upgrade it anymore, they had about two billion. Uh, versions of it out there and even today there's an estimated 12 million people who are still using windows xp and if microsoft was to release the source code for windows xp maybe those 12 million people could actually get together form a little community and say we need to have windows xp continue to work we need to have windows xp ported to new hardware we need to have windows xp you know, do all these things and they can make a nice business for a small company or an organization to maintain windows xp so you know that's one of the benefits of having a source code distribution or availability of source code because it makes it it moves that change that decision away from a large company and back into the hands of the user the customer And when you chop that off, when you make you when you make rules saying, "Oh, you can't maintain it anymore. You can't distribute the source code changes to uh, to other people anymore," you move it back to that corporation. The decisions made by the yep. corporation. And Mad Dog, by the way, I read your piece on all of this, and it was. Uh... Thank you for putting that out. It was. Well, I, have, I mean, I hope that I what I, that I left I people with was what I want to see is not just trip through four, more four more clones. I want to see uh, what you're doing, you know, to to create something that's compatible, but which will give a real. Uh, uh, challenge, challenge a real competition to red hat not just you know a no cost or low cost rel a better rel a better model a, a alternative yeah. that people can have yeah I, absolutely and i think like the the foundation of open source is all about you know competition being a good thing Right. When you have different people with different ideas all contributing and, you know, people may have very different takes on the same thing. But then let, let's let's let all of those ideas out of the bag and let's pick the best one based on on merit. Right. And, and I think that's exactly what your what your post was getting at. And uh, I, I think that, you know, a little bit as like a, a community and in tech industry, I think, you know, we, we've seen a, a gravitation away from that like over the last decade and you know I, I i myself would like to pull it back um you know maybe two decades because i think that's really when when the golden era was um and and you know i mean that's just me like i i i like i like our values i like our principles i like our ideals and and i don't want to see them like pulled out from under us I'm well, happy to pull it back two decades, decades, but I'm not happy to get my uh, Slackware disks back out. <laughs> when this thing first came out, you know, various groups like Oracle and SUSE and Rocky, they all said, we're going to make a clone of Red Hat and we're going to distribute that clone. And I said, oh, great. That's wonderful. 
because we have enough distributions of Linux now. I mean, one of the big complaints I hear from people is there's so many distributions of Linux, I don't know which one to have. You know, my answer to them typically is just choose one. If you don't like right. it, then, then choose another one. But the people that drive me crazy are the people who say there's so many distributions of Linux and I'm going to be using this one over here and that one over here and this one over here and that one over here. And they're not all the same. I said, yeah, they're not all the same because those people decided that they wanted to have a distribution that was going to fit one thing. So pick a distribution and stick right. with it for a while. Right. So yeah. it, it drives me crazy. And to have four more distributions added that are exact clones of Red Hat is crazy talk. You know, get together, form one, but make it better. That's what I want to see. And, 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 and the concept is, too, that it isn't just bits that makes up an enterprise system. The bits are just where it starts. But the right. thing that really makes it up is the channels, the, the, the support, the ability that you can find somebody locally that can come out and do something for you. That's what makes an enterprise system, right? Yep. And there's many ways of doing that. But making four clones and just sitting back and, and wiping your hands like this doesn't do it. And I've told, I've, and, and I also like your, your observation of companies versus communities. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, you know, I fight all the time about, and I'm going to, maybe I'm going to say some words that people are going to be mad at me about, capitalism versus socialism, Right. If you look at a community model, democratic socialism is what it's about. That the people that are making decisions are either the developers who make it, the employees, or they're the customers who are, who are buying it, who are receiving it and stuff. And if you put those two people in charge, there's, you know, one of those two groups or both in charge, you're in good shape. But if you leave it up to a bunch of stockholders who can barely say the word Linux, and all they want to see are profits, you're going to lose. Somebody's going to lose. Yep. Hey, uh, yeah, well, one thing I wanted to ask, um, about, going back to the CPU issue, uh, if, I want to, if I'm looking at eBay for a server and I want to find something with the newer CPU, uh, can you suggest somebody could uh, search for it to make sure I'm getting the newer CPU? Uh, yeah, you'll probably want to look at like HP gen 8 or gen 9 those should have the the newer processor in there okay hey uh okay. jerry yeah, think... sorry um jerry i do need to drop soon yeah, so i know i just want to yeah thank yeah. you for coming and i yeah i know you need to drop pretty soon so yeah so, uh, by the way, thank you so much, everyone. Um, my email is just jack at Alma Linux. Um, if you want to reach out to me, jack at Alma Linux dot org. Um, and you can also we have a chat that Alma Linux dot org, uh, which is our mattermost server. And you can you can find us there. And uh, I'm on there, too. So if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm sorry that I have to drop, but uh, feel free to just reach out to me. Uh, and we can continue continue talking. Hey, can you paste those URLs into the chat uh, chat box? Yeah, yeah, good idea. Thanks, Jack. That was really cool, and I, I think you could tell with Mad Dog's response and everybody else's that, that you're you're preaching to the converted here. But uh, yeah. to have you here with an update and everything is is a great example of why community is is better. Yeah, absolutely, and and the, you know. That's what it's all about. Like, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell everyone, you know, guys, don't forget community. Like, it's, it's, everything is getting so commercialized, and I think we're losing ourselves a little bit. So make sure that, you know, stick steadfast to, to what we originally set out to do. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thanks. 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 Thanks for all the great questions.